Freedom Church. Oh, that's what we're working with today? That's what we're working with. That's the Labor Day vibes, huh? You're going to bring Labor Day vibes into, man, who is expecting God to change their life today? Honestly. You guys suck. I'm out of here. Who's expecting the living God to speak to your heart, to call dead things to life, and to unleash you into a purpose? Who came to worship the King of Kings, the Lord of Lords, the greatest name that deserves all praise and glory, nobody greater? I, I almost crawled out from underneath there, but then I was like, it's not going to work. I mean, I just, my name is Justice, by the way. I'm a weirdo. I'm the pastor. Um, look, here's the deal. Every Sunday, you got to understand that there is a God who is more eager for you to show up and make this time with him than you're even prepared for. When we, when we drive home and we're like, hey, sweetie, what'd you get from the message? You know what I mean? What'd you get from the sermon? I don't know. I don't know. I didn't really like that worship song. Listen, we worship Jesus because not of how we feel, but because of how deserving he is of worship, right? We engage with the teaching of God's word, not because of whatever nonsense I bring to the table, but because we believe this is the living word of God and that everything that comes out of this thing is God's intention for you to hear and to understand because he wants you to be better. He wants you to know how he sees you. You got to understand that when you get here, there has been a prayer team that's gone through all these chairs and prayed for the seat that you're going to sit in. There are people here early this morning setting up and making sure this experience and this atmosphere was not distracting for you. Don't you know there's a God who's been waiting all week for you to show up, make a little more intentional time with him so he can get through your, to your heart and to your head just how much he loves you and just how much you are of value to him and just how great the purpose is for your life. Come on, on your feet if you believe Jesus needs worship. Come on, on on your belief if you des believe he deserves glory. On your feet if you believe this is going to be a day that changes you forever. On your feet if you believe that the power that raised Christ from the dead, come on, is alive in you, changing you, changing you to become more like him. Man, who believes that God has a purpose for your life and you never would have found it if you did not first get saved and chosen by him? Man, if you're expecting an encounter with the living God, would you lift your hand to heaven? Come on. Lord, we come to you this morning, our hands lifted, our hearts ready, our spirit tuned in, leaning into what you would say through your Holy Spirit, leaning into what you'd reveal through your scriptures. We want to be more in love with your son, Jesus. There is nothing that can change us like a fresh revelation of who you are and your love for us. So when we get to the unbreakable promise number four today, which is our purpose, Lord, we pray that we walk out of here just straight shook because we never understood, we never glimpsed, we never could have caught just how much you love us until what you showed us today. Lord, I pray that eternity would erupt in this place, in this house, and that this service would honor you, would glorify you, and would please you, and would worship you. In Jesus' name, we pray. Amen. Come on, give somebody a hug next to you. Give them a high five. If they didn't stand up, just like headbutt them. Bam! Sorry I got to rile you guys up. Don't make me ever do that again. Don't ever make me go behind that screen, okay? I'm not a cheerleader. Don't make me do that. Today we're talking about promise number four. My mom is in the house, though, today. Is my mom here? Where's my mom? Mom, would you stand up, please? And then this is my aunt, Madeline, all the way here from Texas. Thank you for coming today. We love you so much. Mama Coleman. Thanks, Nan. We love you so much. I'm going to tell a story today, Mom, that you've never heard. And um, I don't know why the Lord would choose me to share this story when you're here. And so um, if you want to stay, I would ask you to prepare your heart. When I was <laughs> in fifth grade, you dropped me off at science camp. Do you remember taking me to science camp? Yeah. Um, I was not, I was not uh, a fan of the science or math or Things that are in flask and beakers and all that kind of stuff. I was, I, I, you would have taken me to skateboard camp, I would have been all about it. You know what I mean? Take me to, take me to any camp, you know? But, but science camp, you know? I was not, I wasn't, I, didn't, I wasn't excited about science. That's not a slam on science. If you're a scientist, I'm glad you're here today, okay? We love science, okay? But here's the deal. I, I was probably getting punished. That's probably why you were taking me to science camp. So I'm getting dropped off at science camp, 
and you don't know this story, and, but my sister Lisa is here today. Lisa, will you stand up real quick? This is my sister. She's here. You're in this story too. This is so bad. This is so bad. Man, I should just say this for next week, but it's too late. I'm in too deep. My mom drops me off at science camp, and I'm like, man, forget science camp. Science sucks. I'm like walking to camp, and then they, 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 they go for the sign-in, and they give you a name tag. And they said, what's your name? And they said, your name is Justice. I said, and I don't know why I did this. To, I was like, my name's Jack. <laughs> just like changed my name. Like just write that. My name's Jack, J-A-C-K, Jack. I wrote that, put it on there. I'm like, nobody in this camp knows me. Nobody knows me. I'm going by Jack all week for a week, dude. Every teacher, every person, everybody just called me Jack. I don't know why I did this. I was just like, this is my fresh start. Nobody knows me. I'm going by Jack. They got Jack attack all week. I, I, I am 100% positive that I misbehaved at that camp. And I did things that the counselors were not fans of. And I got in trouble. And so, um, and God has since redeemed me, okay? Anybody glad that God saved you, okay? That, thank you. So don't judge the old me, all right? Thank you. Uh, so, uh, this is before I was redeemed. So, I, uh, I, I, my, I, I'm getting picked up, and I'm just sitting there thinking, like, man, my mom's going to pump pull into this parking lot, and my counselors are going to want to talk to her about all this nonsense that I've been up to. So, I just need to wait till that car pulls in the parking lot, and then I'm going to run out there. I'm going to jump in the car. I'm going to get out of here. Just a, the flight of Jack. Jack is getting out of here. I'm leaving Jack here. I'm out of here. Take the name tag off. Nobody needs to see this. I'm getting here, and I'm just waiting for my mom to show up, waiting for my mom to show up, and my sister pulls up, and I'm like, even better, even better. They're not going to want to talk to my sister, so I just go running to the parking lot. I'm just running, and they're like, <laughs> they're like Jack, <laughs> Jack, and I'm just like, they don't know that, <laughs> so I'm just like running, and I know they're calling for Jack, but my, my sister doesn't know who Jack is. I just run, I just jump in the car, and we pull out, and Lisa, you're like, you're like, who, who's Jack? What, what's that all about? I was like, I don't know. Just drive. Let's go. Let me, let me tell you about all that I learned about science. Let me tell you. Like, it was, I totally escaped. Anyways, I just told you that because I've been harboring, I've been hanging on to that sin for like 13 years, for like 23 years. I, I tell you. I want to talk today about the fourth unbreakable promise, which is about you discovering your purpose. But I want you to know that you will never get to your purpose if you don't know your identity. You see, purpose is revealed in three parts. It's a revelation of who God is, and this is done by God to you. You can't discover who God is unless he shows himself to you. God shows himself to you because he loves you, and he's got a purpose for your life, and he wants you to know who he is. He wants you to know this love. He wants you to know this intention to your life. The first phase is he's going to reveal himself to you. The second thing is he's going to reveal how much he loves you and who he's made you to be and how he sees you. See, the first, thing, the first step is revelation. The second step is identity. In order to get to your purpose, you've got to have a revelation of who God is. You have to have a revelation of who he's called you to be before you can step into the purpose that he's called you. I'll say it this way. God's not going to bless the person that you want to be. God's going to bless the person he's called you to be. There's a grace on the path that God has set for your life, and when you try to run a different race, when you try to walk a different path, when you head a different direction, you're going to get frustrated, you're going to get tired, and it's not, you're not going to feel that momentum. But let me tell you, there's been promises for your life and an eternity in your heart since the day and even before that you were born. Ecclesiastes chapter 3, Solomon says this. He says, God has put eternity on the human heart. God has put eternity on your heart. And here's how you know that's true, because you've always known that you were meant for more, haven't you? You've always known that you were meant for a greater purpose. You've always known that you were meant to be a part of something bigger than yourself, that you were supposed to fit into a greater plan. You've always known that you were special. Will you turn to the person next to you and say, you're special. Just let them know, you're special. You've always known that. You've always known that. But the only way you're going to get to walking in that place of purpose that God intended for your life, the preference that God has for your life, is if, number one, you encounter God's love and he reveals himself to you. When God reveals himself to you, his name is Jesus. The second place is when he helps you understand how he made you to be and who he's called you to be and how he sees you. When you have to see that, that's called identity. Revelation plus identity is how you get to purpose. Are you guys with me this morning? I want you to look at this story with me in, in, in uh, Matthew chapter, I believe it's 16. It's a story of, of, of Simon Peter. Now, Simon was a guy who had a nickname, right? Just like I tried to nickname myself. I tried to go by Jack. Uh, let me tell you something. You can't nickname yourself, right? I, 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 I have nicknames for everybody that I love. Anybody else? Somebody after the first service goes, what's my nickname? And I'm like, well, I don't love you that much yet. But listen, 
everybody that I love has a nickname, right? And if you just realize right now you don't have a nickname, I, I'm loving you, but we got, we got a place to go. Here's the thing. I had a friend who was on my team for a long time named Pastor Pablo. Do you guys remember Pastor Pablo? He's a pastor in another church right now. I still talk to him every single week. He tried to get a good nickname, but he broke the rule of nicknames where he tried to nickname himself. You can't nickname yourself, right? Nicknames, this is an organic thing. This has got to come. This has got to, this has got to come, you know what I mean? I, 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 try to, I try to make myself, you know, jack and do that. You can't, you, it's just got to, it's got to kind of organically kind of flow here, okay? I mean, here, here's the deal. He started calling himself the bishop. He literally started calling himself the bishop. Do you guys remember that? You know, we have two churches, and we have one in Highland Park, right? And, he start, and people in Highland Park started calling him the bishop. And I'm like, where is this nickname coming from? I had to get to the bottom of this, man. You can't just go make up your own nickname, right? And it turns out he'd been telling people that his nickname was the bishop. And I called him on it. And I just, I just called him on it. I told everybody. I said, this is not his nickname. His nickname is not the bishop. You can't call him that, okay? He's going to have a new nickname. It's going to be something natural that we all, right? I uh, grew up uh, in the valley, white boy from the valley. Uh, didn't have a lot of nicknames. But I moved to Highland Park when I first got married and uh, I was, I tell you stories all the time about being in Highland Park because it was a predominantly Hispanic church. And so I was the only white guy in the church. And I tell these stories all the time about this culture shock, right? It, w it wouldn't be till later that I found out that Jesus is Mexican. But um, <laughs> I know, I know. It took me so long to figure this out. Um, uh, <laughs> uh, <laughs> you see what I did, Mom? I didn't say something that came to my mind. You have taught me so well. I use self-control right now. Um, and I'm there, and I'm hanging out with my, my, my friends who are Hispanic, and they're, 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 they, I'm at their house all the time for dinner, you know what I mean? Any, uh, any Cosole fans in the house? Come on. Any uh, Cosido fans in the house? Any Threpa fans? Is that what it's called? With the, what's the tongue? Lengua? What's, is there something called Threpas? Threp what is that? Is it delicious? Any Enchilada fans in the house? Okay, there we go. So I'm eating this delicious comida, if you will, from the Mercado. I'm eating it. It's delicious. And uh, this dude who, never, who, who doesn't go to the church, but his family goes to the church, he starts calling me a nickname, and I just catch it. And so it gets on, it just, it, just, it just sticks to me. And suddenly everybody in the hood starts calling me this nickname. And out of nowhere, I had this nickname. And people, <laughs> I'm not even kidding, dozens and dozens of people just started calling me Miklo. Some of you don't even know about Miklo. Did anybody see blood in, blood out? He's like the one white dude in the gang, right? <laughs> they start calling me Miklo, which I'm telling you, that's a good nickname, right? There's worse nicknames. Anybody ever had a bad nickname in your life? Anybody ever just put a label or a stamp or a name on you, you know what I mean? I got, Miklo's a pretty good nickname. Anyways, my point to all this, now that I spent 13 minutes talking about this, is that sometimes a name means more than just, you know, how you see yourself. Sometimes his name is about how other people have seen you. And God encounters this guy named Simon. No offense to anybody named Simon, but he changes his name from Simon to Peter. And I don't know why, I don't know what Hebrew, you know, in Hebrew Simon means, but I know what in, in Hebrew and in Aramaic what Peter means. God changes his name from Simon to Peter, and do you know what Peter means? It means the rock. Tell me that is not the coolest nickname in the world, The Rock. How cool is that? That's almost as cool as Miklo. The Rock is a super cool nickname. Can you imagine if Jesus was looking at you one day and he's like, you know what? Something's changed in you. Something's changed. And from now on, we're ditching Simon. Everybody, listen up. This is my boy, The Rock, right here. He's going by The Rock from here on. And imagine it stuck. Like, like this, everybody, it stuck. And everybody started calling you The Rock. But imagine Jesus names you something and everyone starts calling you that. You see, Jesus has this two years with the disciples, and they're stumbling along. They're trying to figure this out. You start to figure out about, about by Matthew chapter 16 that they don't have it all figured out. And finally, Jesus just says, when, 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 when Jesus came to the region of Caesarea Philippi, he asked his disciples, who do people say the Son of Man is? Tell me about my nicknames. They replied, some say John the Baptist, others say Elijah, and still others, Jeremiah or one of the prophets. Some say John the Baptist, but he's dead. Right? Some say Elijah, he's dead. Some say, you know, one of the prophets that are gone now. But what about you, he asked, who do you say that I am? Simon Peter answered, you are the Messiah, the son of the living God. What's that called? It's called revelation. You see, he sees Jesus, who he really is, as God. 
Nobody else had the courage to say it. Nobody else had that moment revealed to them yet. So he steps in and says, no, I got it. You're the Messiah. You're the son of God. Nobody else is willing to say it, but I'm willing to say it. Do you know how powerful your words are? Do you know how powerful it is when you begin to say who Jesus is, when you begin to say that your faith and the trust is him, when you begin to say that he's Lord? Your words are powerful. And he said, I'm going to come out and say it. You're the Messiah. You're the son of God. And I love what Jesus says. He says, blessed are you, Simon, son of Jonah, for this was not revealed to you by flesh and blood, but by my Father in heaven. Who God is has to be revealed to you by him. Are you guys with me? You ha- your revelation that you have right now, if you understand that Jesus is who he is, that's because God in his mercy showed himself to you. It says in John chapter 15, verse 16, Jesus says, you did not choose me. I chose you, and I appointed you that you would bear much fruit, fruit that remain in me. We think because of our experience that we choose God. Let me tell you something. God chose you. God saw you when you were lost. God saw you when you were struggling. God saw you when you were wandering around. You were living in your own purpose. God saw you and said, you know what? I love you. I'm choosing you. You're here today because you're chosen. You're here today because God loves you. And in his mercy, he said, I want them. That's promise number one. That's promise number one, that we be lost without God. He says in, it says in Exodus chapter 6, verse 6. It says that he promises to call you out of slavery. That's what we've been talking about this week. God saw you and he called you out. You couldn't deliver yourself. You couldn't free yourself. You couldn't find him on your own. God saw you. He revealed himself to you. Anybody grateful for a God who loves you that much? And that understanding of God just grows and grows and grows. It just, it just, his grace just gets more and more overwhelming as you realize, wow, I really was a wreck. It says, you would not have known this if I hadn't revealed it to you, if the heavenly father had not revealed it to you. Then he says this next line. So I tell you, now that we have uh, gone through revelation, let's move into the next one, which is identity. So he says, and I tell you that you are Peter, and on this rock I will build my church. I just think this is the most exciting passage in scripture. I tell you, let me, you tell me who you think I, you're right. Ding, 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 ding. Let me tell you who you are. You're right, I'm Jesus. And now that you know that I'm, you know that I'm the Christ, now that you know that I'm God, this is going to come off a whole different way. Because I'm not just a rabbi telling you. I'm not just a loved one telling you. I'm not just your close friend telling you. I'm not just somebody at science camp calling you what's yours on your name tag. Now that you know who is actually talking to you, are you guys with me right now? Let this sink into your bones. I don't see you the way that you see you. I see you the way I see you because I created you for a purpose. So let me tell you about that purpose. Let the living God that you just pointed out, this is not your homie telling you what he thinks. This is who God created you to be, being spoken over your life. And he says, I tell you that you are Peter, and on this rock I will build my church, and the gates of hell, or Hades, will not overcome it. I will give you, the next one, purpose. Did you guys see that? He starts with revelation. He says, let me show you. Who do they say that I am? He pulls it out of them. You are the Messiah. You are God. Okay, now that that's been revealed to you from heaven, let me tell you what heaven says about you. You're not who you think you are. The best version of yourself is yet to come. You are Peter. You're like a rock. You're steadfast. You're secure. Oh, maybe you've been lying. Maybe, maybe other people have told you they can't count on you. Maybe other people have told you you're not faithful. Maybe other people have told you you're not going to make it. Maybe other people have told you you're going to keep struggling. Maybe other people have told you you're still a slave. You're not going to make it. There's nothing connected to a purpose to your life. Let me tell you how I see you. I made you for a reason. I made you for a purpose. The best is yet to come. In fact, the gates of hell can't even stop what I'm going to do through your life. There's some gates lined up. And on the other side of these gates are people that are lost and they're enslaved and they're, and they're in their own sin and they don't think they're going to make it. They're just not going to get on it. And let me tell you, Peter, who you are. You're the guy who walks up to those gates and because of what I've revealed about who I am and what I've said about who you are and the Holy Spirit, you're the guy who walks up to the gates that's between me and other people and you bust those gates in and you rescue them out of darkness. That's your purpose for your life. You've got to start with a healthy understanding of just how amazing the grace of God is. That while we were still sinners, he died for us. Are you with me, Freedom Church? While we were still sinners, we didn't deserve it, we didn't earn it, we weren't gonna get there, we were lost. Jesus says it this way, there's blind people and there's seeing people. You were blind people, now you see. He said there's lost people and there's found people. You were lost, now you're found. Jesus says there was dead people and there's alive people. You were dead, now you're alive. Are you guys with me? 
the grace of God, bam, then you get this, this relationship with God. And the grace of God, the revelation of who he is doesn't change. It just keeps growing and growing and growing. But the revelation of who he's called you to be also keeps growing and growing and growing. So now you start realizing that the way he puts you together is for a purpose. Your design determines your destiny. The things that he's working in you is for his good and for his purpose. The frustrating thing is when you try to take your old purposes that were conceived in sin before you were saved and before you knew God and try to bring that into your new purpose, and that's when you get tired and you get frustrated. You have to be willing to surrender the old purpose, the old life, everything that it is, in order to walk into the new thing that God has for you. And when you're willing to do that, then you're going to find the momentum. Then you're going to find the promises that are in motion. You're going to find this, 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 this momentum that's on your side. You're gonna, doors are going to start opening for you. Things are going to start flowing. And you're not realizing, oh, this is who I was meant to be. You ever just know the things that you're good at and choose to do those things because you feel like winning for once? You ever, okay, I'm not talking to any competitive people. Man, I am the most competitive guy around, okay? And it's kind of an issue. Here's the deal. I won't compete in games that I don't think I'm going to win at. Anybody? <laughs> I don't want to play that board game. I suck at that board game. Let's play that one board game that I won at last time. Am I the only one having church this morning? You were designed. You were created to win, man. You were created for a purpose. And as God reveals his love to you, that's going to fuel this constant revelation about who he's called you and created you to be. And that grace plus that truth over time is going to equal what, guys? Growth. And as you grow, as you mature, then you start walking into your purpose. But what the world tries to do is they try to find God on their own. And I'm not saying the pursuit of God is wrong, but I'm saying there's a lot of people that feel like and act like as they go after God on their own that they will achieve enlightenment, that they will transcend, that they will get to God. But the gospel truth, the beautiful thing, is that we won't be able to do that if he didn't love us so much. It's a beautiful picture. It's a beautiful picture that God left heaven and came to earth to get you, to rescue you, to call you, and to activate you. That's the beautiful picture of the good news. And in that, that metamorphosis that's happening, right? Heard a, uh, the, 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 after, after, after Simon Peter's name is changed and he's the rock. Man, I love the nickname the rock. And I love that it sticked. After he left, people stopped calling him. It says that after this, six days later, Jesus took with him Peter, James, and John, the brother of James. This is just right after this. And he, and, and he led them up on a high mountain by themselves. Not everybody got to go on this trip. There he was transfigured before them. His face shone like the sun, and his clothes became as white as the light. And just then there appeared before them Moses and Elijah talking with them. Jesus goes, okay. Now that you have an understanding of who I am, that I am, I am not just a rabbi, okay, that I'm not just man, but I'm the God man. I am God in human form. I am God, I am Christ incarnate, I am Jesus. I am the Christ. Now that you get this revelation, now I need to take you on a trip. Come with me up to the top of this mountain. And he takes him to the first ever man camp. Any men in the house this morning? This is the first man camp that ever happened. Ladies, I'm excited for your, your merch. I'm excited for your sweatpants out there. I love it. I love your sweatpants. I love your sweats, okay? Here's the deal. The first retreat was a man camp. That's all I'm saying. That's all I'm saying. The first one was dudes on a mountain. Okay, so they get to the top of this mountain, okay? And I don't know how long it took them to get to this mountain. I don't know if it took days. I don't know how long. But I'm just imagining the whole time they're going up to this mountain, they're thinking, I wonder what's at the top of this mountain. Like, I wonder why God, I want, now that we know that he's the Messiah, I wonder why he needs us to get to the top of this mountain. I bet you there's some sort of temple up there. I bet you there's some sort of crazy monks up there who know Kung Fu. There's probably all sorts of stuff at the top of this mountain. What's on the top of this secret mountain? And so they're just, they're just pumped on it, you know? They're, just, they're talking about it, and Jesus is just like, come and see, come and see, come and see. They get to the top of this mountain, and it says that Jesus transfigures in front of them. The word transfigure is where we get the Greek word metamorphoso or metamorphosis, right? Jesus transfigures in front of him. Catch this. If you miss this, you miss the whole thing. Jesus transforms. He doesn't conform. You guys with me? To transform is to metamorphosize into who you really are and were meant to be. To conform is to take a different shape than you were intended to be. See, the world doesn't know transformation. They know being conformed. They get a nickname stuck on them. Maybe I'm preaching to somebody right now. You get a label put on you. 
You get a comparison game going in your life. You get somebody else telling you the purpose for your life. You get somebody else telling you the identity for your life. When you skip the revelation of God, you miss understanding who he's called you to be. And other people want to skip God and go straight to self-help and making themselves the best version of themselves. And when you skip a revelation from God, you skip the fact that you are a creation made in the image of a creator. And if you don't know, your, if you don't know who you are, you'll never get to where God's called you to be. But when you're in this place, in the shadow, that's a good way to say it, of the grace of God, and the covering of the grace of God, better way to say it, it's in that place that God speaks to you and calls you. And some of these things that he said before you were even a Christian, he was speaking to you before that. God's loved you since, he's loved you since before you are born. It says in Psalms 134, he said a plan for your life since before you were the foundations of the world. So, so, so in that revelation, Peter moves up to this mountain, and it says that Jesus transfigures. This is his face goes white. It says his clothes go white. It says it looks like the sun. This story is in every single one of the Gospels because this is like the greatest miracle these guys have ever seen. They were told who Jesus was. You're the Messiah. And then they were shown who Jesus is. He said, now that I got all three of you guys up here, by the way, he tells them, don't you ever tell anybody about this until after I've risen from the dead. That's what he says. He says, watch this. And he transfigures into the glory of God in front of him. The glory of God. And they see Jesus and the glory of God. And they're like, and what do they do? How do they respond when they see him? It says they fall down on their face. It says they go straight fetal position, start sucking their thumbs because they're scared. They're scared of the glory of God, which is appropriate because that's how big God is, right? And so they see God in his glory. And it says, Peter said to Jesus, Lord, is it good for, it, it, is, it is good for us to be up here. Peter's like, this is amazing. This is so much better than any of the other stuff you had us doing down there in the valley. <laughs> down there in the valley before the trip up here, that was a lot of work. But up here, man, we're in the glory of God. We're seeing you the way nobody else gets to see you. We got special time up here. This is good for us to be here. Why don't, we should stay here. <laughs> That's what Peter says. We should stay here. I got an idea. Let's just camp out. Listen to what he says. While he was still, Lord, is it good for you to be, if you wish, I'll put up three shelters, one for you, one for Moses, one for Elijah. And while he was still speaking, a bright cloud covered them, and a voice from the cloud said, this is my son, whom I love. With him I am well pleased. Listen to him. In other words, Peter, shut up. <laughs> Peter, this is not talking time, okay? Be quiet. When the disciples heard this, they fell face down on the ground, terrified. But Jesus came and he touched them. Get up, he said. Don't be afraid. And when they looked up, they saw no one except Jesus. And as they were coming down the mountain, Jesus instructed them, don't tell anyone what you've seen until the Son of Man is embraced from the dead. Jesus builds a relationship with Peter. He calls him. He invites him into his boat. He invites him to be a disciple. He invites him into this internship with him. He takes him on a journey. He's, he loves him despite all his knucklehead Peter tendencies. Two years later, chapter 16 of Matthew, he finally gets that Jesus is God. Anybody, any slow learners in the house or am I the only one? He finally figures out that he's God. You're the Messiah. Okay, now that you know who I am, let me tell you who you really are. And he begins to work on that with him. Takes him up to the top of the mountain. Transfigures in front of him. But why would Jesus transfigure in front of Peter, James, and John unless he was walking before them a process that they would also partake in? You see, what Jesus is showing us here is the journey that we go on together. And in Romans chapter 12, it says this. Don't be conformed, it says. Therefore, I urge you, brothers and sisters, don't be in the view of God's mercy. And offer your bodies a living sacrifice, holy and pleasing to God. This is your true and proper worship. Do not be conformed by the pattern of this world, but be transformed by the renewing of your mind, that you will be able to test and approve what God's will is, his good, pleasing, and perfect will. What's that? What is God's good, pleasing, and perfect will? Your purpose. You see what he's doing there? He's saying revelation about who God is, plus your identity, who God says you are, is the process to you understanding your purpose. You stand to your feet all over this building. 
I don't know where you're getting hung up on. I don't know if you're getting hung up on the fact that God is who he says that he is and you need to humble yourself and declare that he is Lord today. I don't know if that's where you're getting hung up. I'm grateful for the 27 people that gave their life to Jesus last week. Anybody else? That's pretty amazing. I don't know what stage you're at. I don't know if you're in the second phase where, yeah, you believe in Jesus. You believe in Jesus. You believe he is who he says he is, but you forgot that Jesus believes in you and you are who he says you are. You believe in Jesus. You believe in God. You believe in his love. But even right now, what's going on in your mind is the labels and the things that have been set over you saying that you're never gonna get free of this anxiety, saying you're never gonna get free of this struggle, saying you're never gonna get free of this addiction, you're never gonna get free of those names and that persona and that, that was, was stamped on you and said about you for so long. Man, I'm gonna tell you, the power that reveals Jesus to you, the power that God chooses you and reveals God to you is the same power that can break off the bondage and the chains that are holding you back from you being who God says that you are. I'm gonna tell you that right now. It can break it off. It can break it off. God can tell you in an instant. God can change you in an instant what you've been trying to change on your own for 10 years. God today can speak to your heart. He can speak to your mind. That's why it says in Romans chapter 12, it's the renewing of your mind that helps you because the renewing of your mind that brings transformation is the same word in Greek of transfiguration that Jesus is on the mountain. The mountaintop experience that you're looking for God, that's actually gonna happen in your mind. It's gonna be a revelation of his love for you. It's gonna change you. It's gonna rewire you. It's a brain transplant. It's a redemption of your mind. You're not gonna look in the mirror anymore and see those lies, but you're gonna look in the mirror and you're gonna see a son or daughter of God because that's how God sees you when he looks at you. That's how he sees you. He doesn't see you like this lie. He doesn't see an addict. He doesn't see a sinner. He doesn't see a, a, a mess or a bunch of wreckage. He sees somebody that's so valuable to him. He's like, man, I'll die for that person. He sees somebody with such great person, purpose. He says, I'll give him a destiny. I'll die for that destiny. He sees you and your, your struggle and he says, that struggle is nothing compared to the, the love that I want to erupt in them. Man, give God your soul. Let him redeem you today. Let him unleash you into the purpose. If that's you and you need to shake off these lies that the enemy's been telling you. You need to shake off the judgment that the world's been putting on you. You need to shake off the old persona. You need to take the Jack name tag off. I'm tired of Jack. Jack was never who I was meant to be. If that's you and you need to shake that off today, would you raise your hands to the Lord? I'm gonna pray over you. You need to shake off the old identity. You're gonna stop it. You're gonna stop saying those things about yourself. You're gonna stop believing those lies about yourself. Every hand that's lifted up, you're saying, God, I want more of you. I want more of you. Reach both hands up to God. Let him know, let him know. Just begin to speak in your own language. God, I want more of you. Thank you for showing yourself to me. Lord, I wanna know more of you. Just say it in your own language, either on your lips or in your mind. Say, I'm, I'm serious, God. I can't do this on my own. I, I need a brain, I need my mind to be renewed this morning. I need, I need a fresh revelation of your love for me. I need a fresh revelation of my wholeness and my healing. I need a fresh revelation of purpose for my life. I need to stop seeing myself the way that I've always seen myself. I need to see myself the way you do. I need to know the nickname that is on your heart for me. I need to know it. Lord, I pray for every heart that's crying out to you right now. Before we even approach this table in communion, we approach you in a personal manner that says, God, I want more of you. Lord, I pray that the four unbreakable promises would reign true over and over and over again for every person with their hands lifted, to every person who cry out to you. Lord, that you called us out, that you delivered us, that you redeemed us, and that you give us purpose. Come on, let's worship the Lord together.